Hi, I'm Amri Desai, editor of MooseSmartly.com, and this is The Moose Smartly Show. Today's episode is our monthly Q&A, where you ask us your questions about the Toronto area real estate market, and my co-host, John Basalis, president and broker of Velocity Realty here in Toronto, responds. As always, if you enjoy listening to our show and find it informative, I'd like to ask you to please leave a review, like, subscribe, follow, and share wherever you are watching or listening to us from. Thank you for your support. We appreciate it, as always. And now, on to the show. Hi, John. Hello. Are you ready to respond? Ready to go through our questions. I enjoy this segment, as I always say. It's uh, We get these kind of real-life situations and, and do our best, obviously, to help uh, answer them. And in some cases, just more intellectual questions that we got to think about and um, try to make some sense of for people. So yeah, it's, it's always an exciting show. Yes, yeah, so we get a mix of consumer questions and also what I would call citizen questions, which is, you know, questions about the overall state of Canada's housing situation, the affordability crisis. And so we get a mix of both. Mm -hmm. this exactly. Segment. So we, uh, we definitely try to include um, a lot of consumer ones. Uh, mainly because, you know, people are navigating real situations. And John, are you noticing that because the market's in a strange place where some segments are fast, others are sluggish, there is a slowdown relative to what Torontonians have been used to for many years. Are you finding a lot more questions about, you know, what we call this situation, complicated situations that need to be navigated? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, I think people are used to a very competitive market in Toronto. Things sell quickly. When things aren't selling quickly, everyone's wondering what the heck's going on. Why isn't my condo selling? Why isn't my house selling? Why isn't my neighbor's house selling? Uh, it's been on the market for a month. You know, these are things that people aren't really used to in Toronto. Uh, and yeah, I, we do, do get a lot more questions now, just given how much slower the market is. All right. So let's start with one of those and uh, hear what you have to say. Hi, John. We currently own a house in a nice neighborhood in Toronto. We want to upsize and we were planning to buy our next home and then sell our current one. But we are seeing a lot of homes not selling in our neighborhood or taking a lot longer to sell or in some cases taking a lower price than we'd have ex expected. So what do you recommend we do? Do we go ahead and buy first, even though there is uncertainty around a sale, or do we sell first? which would then put pressure on us to buy quickly after we sell or even have to move into a short-term rental if we're still looking to buy. Thanks, Willie. That's a great question. And we've get, been getting it far more lately. Uh, again, going back to this idea that the market is much slower than it has been in before, um, which leaves people less confident about the market. So, you know, just to unpack some of the challenges with this and to unpack what people used to do and why that's a little bit trickier now is like usually in Toronto, people would buy the home that they want to move to first. As soon as they buy, they just list their home on the market. And usually it sells in a week. Uh, or if it's a condo, it would sell in two or three weeks, you know, but generally homes were moving quickly. Um, so that is the strategy most people would take for that reason, because it's usually tough to find a home to buy. It's kind of competitive. It could take six months or however long while, while selling was very easy. Now, today, uh, things are very different because the market's slower. Uh, it's a bit easier to buy because there aren't as many bidding wars, but selling is a little trickier. And, you know, and again, I think it's very neighborhood specific. So condos are definitely slower, much slower. Uh, you know, I would not be buying a home and then trying to sell a condo in this market because it's a very tough market to be selling condos in. There's just a ton of inventory. When it comes to low rise homes, some neighborhoods are busy and sell quickly. Some neighborhoods are slower. And again, even within the neighborhoods, different price points. So I mean, how do you navigate this is a very tricky question. I mean, and part of it just depends on how risk averse you are, um, you know, so if you, and, and where you're looking at buying and where you're looking at selling. So like I said, in, in some areas that we have clients who are looking at uh, selling in a neighborhood that is still pretty busy and doing well, you know, some of them might be more comfortable buying and then selling. But if it's in a slower neighborhood, you know, the risk is just to unpack it. If I bought a home and I've listed my current home for sale 
in most cases, people have to sell their current home in order to be able to close on the home they bought. It's not optional to not sell it. Uh, one misconception is, well, I can just get something called bridge financing. Well, no. In order to get bridge financing, which bridges two transactions, your current home must have sold, right? So if we look back to when prices fell in the GTA in 2022 and in 2017, um, prices fell quickly because a lot of people got caught in two transactions when the market was closing. So they effectively became distressed sellers, right? So if you are buying in this market, um, first, you have to be extremely conservative about what you're getting. Um, you know, you maybe want to focus on getting a discount on your purchase, you know, because in some areas, even though average prices, and I got to think about how I kind of articulate this on our show, it's got to talk about average prices being flat generally, right? Which is true. For the most part, for houses, they're not down very much. But in some areas, houses are definitely selling for less than what they would have sold for six months ago, right? Um, so, you know, if you're looking for a particular home where you can get a bit of a discount, well, okay, maybe when you're selling home, you have a more conservative budget. You don't budget for the top price you would have got six months ago, uh, but you budget for something slightly less and realistic. So you're selling in the market, you're buying at a slight discount, maybe you're selling at a slight discount, right? You have to be realistic. So I think, again, the situation is very particular to the person in the neighborhood. One thing I worry about now for some people who are, and we were talking about this actually in our sales meeting today with our agents, just because we talk about this every week about how to advise our clients and, and what should they do. The one concern we have about people who are looking at selling now and potentially buying is if they sell in the fall, the market's kind of slow right now, you know? And depending on the home they get, maybe they get a slightly less than they would have gotten six months ago. But if the market is busy in the new year when they potentially want to buy, you know, you could just find yourself selling in a slow market and buying in a busier market, which is also not ideal, right? Uh, and I think that's the one tension right now. So if you were to sell now, I would be prepared to buy and take advantage of a slower markets today, right? Like, and, and, you know, make sure that I know whatever I want to buy is kind of relatively easy available. It comes up pretty frequently. It's not going to take me nine months because I wouldn't want to be in a position where I'm buying and selling into different markets. You know, and again, I'm not making a prediction that the market will be busier in the new year. I mean, I, I certainly, you know, released a video this week saying, I think it probably will be. Most people think it will be. Uh, again, part of this is just lower rates, the government's incentives on mortgages are just more stimulus. Um, so you don't want to be in a situation where you're selling in a soft market and buying in a busier market. That's not ideal. So it is challenging. I do find, I think this is one of the challenges with our market today. A lot of people feel stuck for this exact reason. You know, they want to be risk averse. They don't want to get caught into transactions and are trying to have, having a hard time navigating i mean i had a client who bought i'm not gonna tell the story it was an interesting one they bought i mean i'll maybe do another video but they basically were in that exact same scenario and we bought a home conditional on them selling their house right which gives them the ultimate security because they've locked in sort of the price on the home they want to buy they have some time to sell their home they don't have to buy that home until they sell their home for a price they want which is a massive sort of win-win um, and this is a house in Toronto. I mean, it wasn't, you know, like the, you don't get these usually in the Toronto area. Usually those, those types of conditions are common in rural properties, but we were able to get it. Uh, and, you know, it kind of addressed their concerns um, and allowed them to, to make that move. So there are a lot of different ways to navigate it. I think it's just very uh, specific to the market, to the individual and all of these things. So it's uh, the return of the subject to the selling of the buyer's uh, property. Mm -hmm. Now, we haven't seen that kind of clause in action in, in Toronto's hot, hot market in a long time, right? No, no, it's not very common at all. But again, to be clear, this isn't a home that, you know, was dolled up and priced low and getting 10 offers. No, this is a home that was price high, gradually reduced, sat on the market for a while, needed some work, was a bit of a fixer upper, which my clients were fine with because the lot was great. 
Um, you know, so these are the reasons why we were able to do that. You can't do this with every house. I want to make it sound like you can get conditions on, on selling your own home on, on your purchase agreements. It's, it's rare, but we were able to, I was able to negotiate it and kind of make the case to the seller and their agent, which they went with. So, um, you know, I think you just have to understand what everyone's looking for. And originally they said they're not even interested in that. And we just kind of made the case for why they should consider it. And they did. So we got pretty lucky there. Uh, so a couple of strategies there. This, this the house that they had bought, your clients had bought, was a less competitive house, you can say. So that's yes. one way to try it and get a clause like that in. Alternately, you're suggesting to buy a house that's conservative in your budget, like it, it fits in or that it's conservative overall in mm -hmm. the case that your house doesn't sell for as much as you would expect. Or get a bit of a discount again, like in the home that they bought, they got it for a relatively decent price. Like that mm -hmm. home, had it been in, in another period, like six, nine months ago, it would have sold for more. Uh, and again, I think part of it is the market's slower. Uh, and I said on other episodes, like the market's also slower for homes that are slightly fixer uppers that require money to be improved. Like those ones are selling for a little bit less because there's just not as many people who have the capital to buy a whatever it is, 1.5 or $2 million home and spend money to fix it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so those ones uh, are way less busy. So, you know, if you're targeting these and you're getting a discount on the purchase, um, you know, you're in a better place, I'd say. All right, so some strategy strategies there uh, for Will, uh, Willie. I hope that helps. All right, on to our next question. Hi, John, thanks for all the insightful podcasts and YouTube postings, always informative. Lately, I've heard that if I change my rental property to a primary residence, I will have to, well, I will have to pay capital gains tax. Is this new? The reason I ask is because I'm a Canadian non-resident with a rental property in Toronto. I am considering moving back to Toronto when my son goes to university in two years and move into the condo that I'm currently renting out. But if I have to pay capital gains to move into my own condo, wouldn't it be better if I just sell it? or keep it a rental and find myself somewhere else to rent? Or, and I think this is the fourth option now, if you're keeping track, John, can mm -hmm. I just say I'm renting it out to my son and I would just continue to file tax on my rental income, even if it would be zero, as he wouldn't be paying me any rent? What would be the tax in implication on him? Would appreciate your advice on this. Thank you so much, Marnie. Interesting. So this is a, a great question. And so for those for those who aren't familiar with kind of the, the root of this question and what they're talking about, I'm just going to kind of read part of the Canadian government's website that specifically deals with this situation. Um, and it's titled changes in use of your property. And it basically says that when there is a change in use of a property you have, you may be considered to have sold all or part of your property, even though you did not actually sell it. And one example they have is that you change your rental property from a rental to a principal residence. And basically what happens is that the CRA assumes that you've sold it on the day that you moved into it. And you'd have to kind of do a, um, a valuation or appraisal in terms of what it's worth and technically calculate the, the capital gain. Now, there are some ways around it. I'm going to actually include a link uh, in the show notes, uh, I'm not an accountant, so I'm just going to refer uh, to, you know, there are a bunch of websites that discuss this. I kind of knew this, but I just wanted to, I'd rather defer to someone else who's an accountant. Um, and it basically talks about there are ways around this. And the one key thing is um, something called uh, capital cost allowances. So when people file their taxes every year, a uh, house real estate is an asset that depreciates over time. And if you want to lower your income taxes for that given year, you can depreciate that asset, which effectively is a, is a cost to your income and it kind of lowers your taxable income. Now, here's the key thing. And, and I'm going to quote from uh, this website. I'm going to include a link. And it says, scenario one, if you have no capital cost allowances claimed, meaning you did not depreciate your real estate asset during the time that you've owned it. Uh, and this website, Real Estate Tax Tips, I'm going to include the link. I think the, the person's actually a YouTuber as well. Uh, I'll see if I can include their channel. 
She said, if you have never claimed capital cost allowance against the rental income from your prior years before you move into the property, you can elect to defer the capital gain tax until you sell. Okay, so you still have to pay it. But if you have not depreciated, it, you can basically defer that tax. If you have depreciated it, I believe there's kind of, I don't think there's a way around it. You may have to pay the tax. But again, I'm going to kind of include the link. Talk to your accountant. I'm not a, I mean, I'm not a tax expert, but there are ways around it. Um, but again, it depends on how you've been dealing with your investment property during the time that you've owned it. Uh, and how you've managed your uh, depreciation or capital cost allowance. Now, the other question, what was her other question? If I rented it to my son or something like that, right? We wouldn't be paying rent. Uh, <laughs> um, I think the renting it was in quotes. Yeah, okay. So I, I think mean, we're getting is, into a different territory. Here. Yeah, this is a, a different question. I mean, if people, if someone wants to, I mean, I, I, it sounds like this person saying, okay, maybe if they've, depreciated their asset and they have to pay the capital gains. Well, what if I just say my son's renting it or my child's renting it when I'm really living there again, this I'm not, I, I will not be making advice on these situations. Do people do it? I probably would not be surprised. Uh, I don't know how that works. So if that's a red flag, like how do you say you're renting it, your son and your son's not paying income tax. I don't know. Um, again, I would refer to an accountant on this. I'm not going to be giving any tax advice, especially if it is very gray ways around uh, the tax system and loopholes or anything like that. So uh, I'd be getting advice on that one. I'm going to pass All right. on that. John, John refuses to uh, get himself in the sight lines of the CRA over here. Uh, but again, it is worth noting that this person's in a rental would go from being profitable or at least declaring some income to zero all of a sudden yeah. and sometimes on tax returns you wonder if those things get flagged mm -hmm. and 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 that in and of itself is enough for review i remember years back i had friends who were think i think they were trying to get around the hst that you would have to pay on a new condo as mm -hmm. long as you occupied it i think you're exempt but if you were buying it uh, and you were then flipping going, it. yeah, flipping or it. flipping it. And so people were trying to sort of say that, you know, they were living in it mm. uh, rather than flipping it or selling it quickly. And then all of a sudden, a lot of people started getting letters all at the same time, even yeah. though this practice had been happening informally for several years. Yeah. So I guess um, it, it pays to be a bit cautious and always get advice from uh, the right professional in this situation, it would be an accountant. An accountant, yeah, 100%. All right, so those show notes, uh, the show notes will have the link to the government's policy there as well. And um, I hope that helps Marnie. All right, our last question, John, it kind of goes out to that territory we were talking about, where this mm -hmm. is more about a general, it's a consumer question, but it's also a citizen question. All right. The general state of housing in Canada here or mm. Toronto specifically. Hi, Is John. Depress us? Um, it's <laughs> going to probably remind us of what a lot of us already know. All right. Hi, John. Some what longtime listener and appreciate your feedback. Uh, sorry, your work. I have a question about your thoughts about retirement and financial planning in Canada. I'm 31 years old now, and I became interested in politics, real estate, and real estate specifically because my entire savings were made worthless by the 2021 run-up. I assume they mean in home prices. Uh -huh. My wife and I bought a home for 700000 in Peterborough, and now we're looking at returning to the GTA or the greater Toronto area. My wife and I make a good combined household income that is much higher than many of our friends, and we are still struggling to buy a decent three-bedroom detached home in Newmarket big enough for our child and in-laws. So for all, all viewers and listeners, Newmarket is a suburb just north of Toronto. It's difficult to grapple with how the prices of a starter SFH, single, single family, family home, <laughs> there's an acronym for you, 40 minutes away from downtown is barely within reach for a couple like us. My main concern is simply buying a small home and having enough to save for retirement and for our children. 
So how are younger people saving for retirement these days? And how does it make sense that inflated home prices fund the boomer generation's retirement? Are all boomers multi-property property owners? Do they plan on downgrading as a mean to real, means to realize their capital gains? How are the future generations going to retire at this rate? Concerned listener, Matthew. That's a good question. Yes, and rather <laughs> reminder of our rather depressing state of things here. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so the, I guess the main question was, you know, are boomers leaning on housing as as a uh, as part of the retirement plan, and how's the next generation going to do that? I wonder if that's also uh, John, because you've noted that politicians often have, and you just quoted the prime minister himself saying that houses need to retain their value. Exactly. And, and you know, is that is that because people are leaning on them for retirement? It's part of the whole. They 100% are. Yeah, 100% they are. So not to say that every single boomer has no savings um, and their only asset is their home. Well, I'm sure there are some who are like that. Most have savings. But, you know, this goes into sort of the ter this territory of what, you know, you know, academics refer to as the welfare state, right? Uh, and this really, the welfare, I mean, when people hear about welfare in Canada, they think, well, you know, the people who are just making no money, right? Like they, we think of it as like this, this government support for people who have zero income. And the, that's not what welfare state is. The, the idea of the welfare state is the policies that governments put in place to protect sort of like the economic and social well-being of citizens through the entire period of their life, right? This includes programs like unemployment insurance, like, you know, welfare for those who don't have means, like Medicare, like old age security, like all of these programs that are designed to maintain a certain standard of living for all citizens, right? Um, and, and, Different countries have different approaches to it. Canada happens to be one of these countries that have what, you know, uh, academics call an asset-based welfare state. And, and by that, they mean assets. And by assets, they primarily mean housing is a key part of Canada's approach to uh, helping people in their old age of maintaining a certain standard of living of, of supporting seniors. Now, this is, I mean, not surprising. I mean, if we think about our prime minister our like so many politicians talk about, we need to protect the value of homes specifically for seniors. It's a big part of their investment and their retirement. The one weird thing about Canada is that, you know, many of the government like old age security, like many of these policies, again, I'm not an expert, you know, this is my knowledge. So I mean, I'll have to fact check some of this stuff on my own after, but things like old age security, I don't believe are like means tested, right? Meaning, uh, sorry, not means tested. They're not, uh, they're not a function of your assets. I should take there. Of course, uh, means yes, tested. They're, yes, they're means, they're means tested, tested by on income. income. Yes. yes. I apologize. Yes. Mm -hmm. For clarity, they're means tested based on income, but not on assets. Right. So it's only right? some of your means. Yes, yeah, so so exactly. Which which means, you know, two people making the same income will get the same benefit from our government, independent of the fact that one's a renter has very little assets and savings, while the other one has got a $2 million house in Toronto, right? Same approaches. So it's a system that really favors, of course, homeowners. This is partly why so many people want to buy a home. Um and why, you know, we have this tension in Canada where fewer are fewer people are buying, like our ownership rates is declining, which is putting more people into renting long term. Uh, but again, our again, our welfare state is not really designed to support wealth, wealth uh, renters as much as it is designed to support homeowners. Right. So our entire approach in Canada is to inflate home prices effectively Um you know, to support, to support our economy, to support our seniors. There's all sorts of reasons. It's not just to help seniors in retirement. There are many reasons why governments, and we talked about this on our last show on the mortgage policies, it's housing, wealth is a big driver of our economy and the debt that accumulates on us, so all sorts of things. But again, it's also a big source of savings. Many boomers don't have mortgages. You know, they're not going out 
and leveraging and you know buying pre-construction condos and all of that stuff. They have, in many cases, zero debt. And yes, many of them will be selling their, you know, if they live in Toronto, $2 million homes or million dollar homes um, and using that equity. I mean, I, I was in a house the other day and like the owner bought it in 1960 for $16,000, right? And this is in a relatively affordable-ish pocket in Toronto, and the home's probably worth close to a million today, right? So the owners moved out. They're not living in the home anymore. They're, you know, moving into a senior zone, but now they have a million dollars in equity that they can just invest, you know, uh, to help fund their retirement over the, you know, the however many years left, 20 plus, who knows, right? But yes, people use their housing wealth to help fund their retirements. I'm going to also add that in Canada, we, we've reached a point where housing is so unaffordable. Many people are using this wealth to help their kids buy a home, right? Where, you know, you have this tension where you just feel like you have to borrow against this wealth to help your child buy a home. And some people can, some people can't. Some people need it for their retirement. Some people will take less and downsize. So they're, you know, because the gifts today are much bigger than they were 15 years ago, you know, parents are giving relatively large gifts because home prices are so much higher uh, and it's harder to get in. So the long and short of the answer is that, yes, the boomers have had it quite well, very well. I mean, home prices have exploded in Canada. Um, the younger generation are kind of getting the short end of the stick because they're much more of their income is being used to actually support seniors today, right? And I think this is part of the general rational fairness that isn't really fair. It's one thing to be supporting people, obviously, who are, are seniors who don't own homes, right? It's another thing for someone who's like a young 30 or something trying to save money for their home, who's financing the lifestyle of a boomer who's got like, multiple properties and although they show a relatively modest income have millions in assets right um and in our system that's what happens right and this is one of the tensions of this intergenerational unfairness i mean i think our government maybe talks about intergenerational fairness but they're not really doing much about this stuff um so it is going to be it's going to be harder for the next generation to buy and to save for retirement and in many cases Many people just might not save for retirement. They just might lean on their home as an asset for their retirement because they don't have an additional savings, right? And again, obviously, I'm not advocating that. I mean, if you talk to any financial planner, that's a bad strategy. But, you know, the flip side is you live, you know, you rent, you have no savings. You know what I mean? Like you live this precarious life where your, your landlord can kick you out with, you know, two months notice because they sold the property. So I think people are making certain sacrifices um, and in some cases not saving for retirement and just leaning on their home because they want some stability, especially if you have a family, you know, you don't want to be kicked out every couple of years. Um, so I think that's definitely one of the tensions that I think many people are are dealing with in Canada right now. Well, that actually, there's a couple worrying things there. Um, you know, one, you say the government is keeping the home prices inflated. I mean, another way to say is that is is they they do things to prevent them from falling at a mm -hmm. wide, you know, when there are uh, maybe markets, dynamics would, mm -hmm. you know, would see a bigger fall than some of the interventions uh, end up, uh, I guess, realizing. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, one of the issues is also that you don't really have to be a boomer with multi-property, multi, uh, a lot of properties to have mm -hmm. benefited, right? Mm -hmm. From, yeah, from no, yeah, yeah, from the wealth increase in the home. And, but what is disturbing, I think, is what the government might not be thinking about and should start is that that boomer generation, especially the ones that just bought the first, that one home mm -hmm. and used it as their main home. And now when they sell that, six, the home they bought for $16,000, there's no mm -hmm. capital gains on that. That's their primary residence, correct? Mm -hmm. So what's happened there is that not only are they realizing those gains, but it seems to me that that generation also used to believe in pension funds, RRSPs, and things like that a lot. Because mm -hmm. at, at the time, it wasn't 
the thing that my home will, you know, the home was kind of like, I won't have to pay rent. It'll protect me, mm -hmm. but not necessarily that it'll be this big cash cow. Mm -hmm. So you have a generation with boomers who, who not only own their homes, but also saved a bit. Yeah, exactly. And so they're coming in with double assets, if you want to think about it. Yeah. When absolutely. you say asset based welfare system, the government also really promotes RRSP, right? They make them tax free, registered yes. savings funds. So it's it's sort of this double whammy of, you know, that that generation having a lot of means. Yeah. And if that's not being, you know, considered or captured in the in the system mm -hmm. as we think about what the next generation should be paying into, you know, exactly. it seems like that gap is only going to widen. Yeah, exactly. A hundred percent. And and listen, it's, there's a tension. Like I'm not like, obviously governments need to do what they can to support seniors. I think the one I get, like I said, the one thing that's missing is integrating assets with incomes to figure out the total wealth and figuring out, yes, what they need to do versus how much can, a, uh, you know, an individual or a couple who are in their, you know, seniors who have a $2 million home, what can they, you know, manage and maintain on their own? I mean, even if you sell that in rent, you're getting a lot of income from $2 million investment, right? So, and I think that's one of the challenges for, you know, younger generations who are trying to get into the market. Um, you know, they're not going to be in the same position probably. So Matthew, I'm not going to suggest that that answer would help you, but maybe it helps to know that you are not alone in wondering about these things and feeling very concerned uh, about this picture. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely yeah. tough. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I guess stay tuned to our channel. We're going to continue to dig into these larger policy issues that are affecting uh, the overall housing market and, and the way that Canada is quite frankly structured. And um, I guess if we share enough information and ideas, maybe we can start to challenge some of the politicians to, you know, start showing us how they plan to manage this. Seems like they're kicking a ball down the road. They are. I mean, and, and one, I think one organization person writes about this a lot is, uh, oh God, what's his name? I think Paul Kershaw from Generation Squeeze. He talks mm -hmm. a lot about these types of dynamics and this relationship between not just housing, but, um, you know, support for senior, like the difference between the sports for seniors versus the supports for you know, younger millennials, for example, and these these disparities and the challenges and these intergenerational inequalities and unfairness and all of these things. He talks a fair bit about that. So definitely worth kind of reading some of his stuff, either in the Globe or on their website, I'd say. All right. So we'll put that link into the show notes as well. Thank you so much uh, to all of you for your great questions. Keep them coming. And uh, you can send in your questions at askjohn at movesmartly.com. You can follow John on uh, X Twitter at ask, uh, ask, <laughs> at John Pizales. John Pizales. And you can follow the show at Move Smartly. So uh, we hope to keep hearing from you. Thank you for all of you uh, that are listening and watching. And we will uh, see you next week with our next show episode. And uh, we'll I see guess you then. take up the, <laughs> take up um, the issues then. Thanks, everyone. Good.